Okay, uh, yeah, so um, as you probably are aware, there's going to be a talk about art and debating. Uh, I'm just going to provide a couple of caveats before I delve into it. The first is a lot, some debating workshops follow a pattern of here is a motion or here is something you're going to have to do in a debate and here's how you should approach it. Uh, and they're very like kind of strategic, systematic, organized, focused, if we will, on the process of debating. My content, my content lectures don't tend to follow that pattern because I think the best way to become good at debating a topic rather than a, sp a few motions that you've learned how to do is to try and understand the topic. Uh, so um, what I mean by that is if you have a, if you leave this lecture with a deeper understanding of the, of the, of the, of the, the philosophical topics basically that I'm going to delve into around art, that means then that you will approach future motions with what I call, well, with what are known as heuristics, which are ways of thinking, ways of processing information. And hopefully this lecture is going to give you um, Sorry, one second. Um, right, great. Now I can see the chat over here. So I can see uh, people typing useful things like ah, la, 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 from, from, from Mark. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so hopefully you're going to uh, leave this having a, a set of tools of thinking about art, of breaking art as, as a concept down in a way that will then allow you to generate motions in the way, sorry, generate arguments in the way that you've otherwise done in other topics, right? So the only reason that people tend to find, you know, topics like social justice or sport, perhaps if that's something you're into, or economics if that's something you're into, or, or perhaps like why voting is the one thing that you can always set as a motion and reliably know that every team will be able to engage with in some sense, because we've all thought about and understood the concepts of democracy, whether that's because we, we studied them in school or because, you know, we do some sort of politically affiliated degree. So I'm hoping you uh, get to that level with art. What this won't cover though, or at least very, I'll only touch on in, in the very briefest sense, is a lot of the unashamed about my opinions on this, the boring arguments that come into art debates. Like if the motion is about, I don't know, uh, funding art from disprivileged backgrounds, you're gonna get some mileage from just running an argument about how this is a source of income and a potential career path for people from dis economically disprivileged communities. Um, that is fine. That's not gonna be covered in this lecture. All of these sort of like uh, traditional, shall we say social justice stuff or the traditional economic stuff, all of the arguments that you already know how to make from other types of motions that can sometimes be sho shoehorned into art debates, all of that stuff you guys either know how to do or will learn in other workshops and other avenues of debating. This is really going to talk about, as I said, the philosophy, the psychology and the culture of art uh, and thereby expand the tool set of, uh, uh, of um, argumentation techniques uh, and, and like concepts that you can bring in, into art debates. The other caveat that I have is uh, I'm not an arts professor. I study chemistry. Uh, I have no real expertise in this. I'm just interested in it. Uh, some of the things in here I'm not even going to claim come from any literature or any like, you know, so some concepts I've taken from people who are much more experienced and have thought about this stuff a lot more. Some of them are just synthesis of concepts that I've encountered in a way that makes sense to me. Uh, if something doesn't make sense to you, feel free to not use it. Feel free to, you know, disregard that. Uh, there is no right way to debate. There's no wrong way to debate. Um, there are different ways that work for different people, and uh, the fact that I am a somewhat accomplished debater means that I have a style that works for me. You should pick and choose from all workshops that you attend to the bits that apply to you and help you, and ignore the bits that don't resonate with you, because trying to apply something that just doesn't connect is never going to work. But hopefully, what, as, as I say, um, this will make some sense. Now, I want to start the, this talk with three questions. And I want you all to, now ideally we'd be in a room and we could kind of like chat to one another about this. Um, but for, for now, I just want you to, to look at these three questions, write them down, copy them into a you know, separate Word document or whatever, and like come up with answers for the first part. And if you think you're confident or you, you know, you're satisfied with the conclusion of the answer to the first part, um, start thinking about the second part of the question. Uh, and there's a reason for this. And the reason is, 
in some sense, we use the answers or the conclusions to these questions a lot in our day to day discussions. Um, but we do so without realizing, and often that means that we don't actually know the underpinning analysis for them, the underpinning reasons for them. So, and, and this is not just unique to art, this is unique to a lot of things. Like, if I asked someone off the top of their head, why is equality something we should strive for in terms of social organization, they'd probably stutter their way through it for a little while and then uh, eventually come up with something. And it probably wouldn't be particularly nuanced or deep, but eventually they would, they would come at something. And I think the, the difficulty is, is that people are using the conclusions and the, the concepts that come out of these questions in arts debates, but without have ever having done the legwork or the thinking of what underpins them. So what is art? What makes art good? And can art change the world? Now, you've had to like, keep thinking about this. Um, I don't, I don't want to leave long gaps in the recording. But to start with, um, we'll come back to them in a second. But yeah, to start with, uh, what do people think of? Uh, I'm not going to advance to the next slide because I know that I have uh, the, the, the answers up. But what do people think of when they think of art? Unmute yourselves or use the chat and just tell me things that come to mind when you think of art. And that is an intentionally vague question. I want to know what you think of. If you see emotion or just the word, if you see the word art or if you see emotion where the word art is in there, what do people think of? Okay, so from the chat, uh, unmute yourself so then people on the recording can hear because they obviously can't see the Zoom chat. But um, some of the answers that have come up in the chat are a product from Nico. Uh, well, interesting. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, Someone, so apologies for butchering the names of those of you who I'm going to read out from the chat, but um, Ajwa says, art is video, music, sculptures, pictures, literature, anything which is a representation of another thing. Anything which is a representation of another thing. That's interesting. Um, someone else said Leonardo da Vinci, very good artist, but yeah, agreed. Uh, Tanya says, may I? I assume that means may you unmute yourselves. Uh, that is an open invitation. Anyone can unmute themselves. So Tanya, by all means, go ahead representation of one's creativity representation of one's creativity i like the answer um okay uh, uh it, there's a lot of uh, interesting concepts here and actually the, the, i mean the obvious answer to this is that there's no like one thing that art is right there's never going to be one answer that someone can give some of the other answers from the chat uh, that i quite like uh, actually i like all of these uh, a form of catharsis um, no. Uh, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and explain to me what, what you mean by that? You uh, don't right. have to, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I think art, first of all, is very subjective to people. For example, how the audience views it, for whom you make art and art for the artist, uh, completely changes because I think these are two simple, uh, different complex art for art's sake and art for life's sake that we usually think about in philosophy, but uh, I think a form of catharsis is basically a fancy term for representing your emotions or finding relatability in art or maybe something that is very innate in you. I think that connects the art and the artist at, at some sort of a level. Okay. Um, that, that's a good answer. Um, catharsis also interestingly is usually associated the word in, um, with, with some sort of positive it, uh, con connotation so like if I say something is cathartic it means that it provides me with like some sort of release like it makes me feel better for having done it um we've got answers that talk about like art as the display of feelings of a person a uh, thought process Vincent van Gogh uh, one of my favorite artists yeah uh, a medium through which internal thoughts can be presented in a way that can be interpreted by some somebody else um okay so far we have a good set of answers, so now I'm going to start attacking them, now I'm going to start breaking them down, because by understanding where these definitions may fail, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get closer. So, let's turn to the idea of uh, what I'm going to broadly encompass as the answers that talk about identity formation. Uh, or, or, sorry, identity expression, taking your emotions, your feelings, and, and expressing them in the form of art, whether that's writing, music, painting, whatever. What if I made, what if I did a painting by commission though? Someone said, I, I, I want a really great painting of um, 12 tulips. Um, and, and, they, and they're like, okay, cool, I'll pay you 12. And they pay me 12 tulips and they look nice. It's not really an expression of their identity. Would you still consider that art? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. So 
It's interesting then, isn't it? Because I don't think your answer was wrong and I don't think anyone who heard it dis disagreed. Uh, someone taking their emotions and expressing them does seem to align with our conception of, of what art is. Um, but it's clearly insufficient. Um, and someone has literally put artists from the heart, but actually a lot of art we know, a lot of, I, I, I don't think a lot of mass produced pop songs uh, came from the heart. I think they came from a ghostwriter's pen. Um, and yet the singer certainly can make it seem like they came from the heart as part of the trick, right? Uh, someone else said their ability is expressed. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay, so let's delve on to let's delve on to this, and then we'll return to these three questions um, because they are essentially we're going to answer these questions throughout this workshop. So here I've put up a an assortment of famous great works of art. Um, so the reason why this slide is here is because the first problem, and I think one of the things that constrains the the complexity, should we say, of the types of arguments that um, people end up making in arts debates. Uh, by the way, can anyone uh, like um, see and hear me okay, uh, like in terms yep, of audio? Yep, okay, cool. yes. I know it's on my computer, everything's frozen, but I don't know if it's just, it's probably just my computer. Cool. Um, so, the um, one of the first problems is people get pigeonholed into painting. It, and in like, Sometimes in better rooms, the scope of artwork expands to like music. But what I want to like point out is so many things can be art, right? Film, architecture, dance, uh, fashion, performance, like writing. Um, when you're thinking about art debates, remember that art can be a br very vast range of different mediums. Um, and that will, and, and the ability to engage with the, the, the nuances of emotion with those different mediums will also be beneficial for you. So just bear that in mind. Now, someone following on from the discussion that we just had, tell me if they think this is art. And, and to be clear, I don't mean the photograph, right? Let's for a second imagine that we're all standing on this, this plane, this savannah, and we're staring up at this mountain range. Is this mountain range art? I mean, it's not made by a human, so why would it be? It's an interesting answer. What, 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 what makes you say that? The, the whole idea of art is that it's anthropocentric, that it's stuff that we create um, or that we influence in some way. So even though this might be beautiful, like, in vogue, it is art. Does anyone disagree? Does anyone want to make a case for why this is art? I disagree. It's the art of God. It's Mother Nature's breath, uh, brush stroke. Okay. So, uh, Nihu, what's your re response to that? Let's, uh, let, let's keep this discussion uh, somewhat secular because otherwise I think we, then it becomes a theological dispute rather than a, um, a, a philosophical one. But let's encompass the sort of you know, the, the metaphysical construct of Mother Nature. If Mother Nature created this, why is that insufficient to make it art, Nico? Um... Or anyone else? I think it's, I disagree actually, I think it's art because it's, upon seeing it, because I am the judge and judging, I am the one calling it art, it's being represented in my sensibilities, in my head. So in my head, it's represented as art because it ignites that kind of sensibility within me. I don't okay. want to get into a demological right. debate, but we, we use words to describe things based on common concepts. And the common concept behind art is that it's something that is created by humans. Um, so things like, so I'm yeah. So I'm I'm broadly gonna I'm broadly gonna uh, I'm gonna agree with Nico here, and there's a specific reason, which is I don't think. Sorry, I think it was Tiny who said, you know, uh, one conception of art is that it's in the eye of the beholder. If someone looks at it and they think it's art, then it is art, and that's perfectly fine. However, for the purposes of um, making this into a useful workshop, we're, we're going to defer to what I think is the more pragmatic conception of it, um, which is the one that Nico posited, which is our understanding of art should cohere with what the average person thinks of when they think of the word art. And the average person would probably say, no, a mountain range or any other natural phenomena uh, doesn't fall under art. They're not right. Uh, I just think that um, it's a useful uh, it's useful to ground ourselves in terms of some sort of common understanding. So, we, so we, we, we've appeared to have some sort of 
uh, first premise, right, which is that we think probably um, humans have to create art. I, I actually don't think it needs to be humans, but I'm going to explain the distinction a little bit further on. All right, what about these things? Nico, they, uh, both of these were made by humans. Um, so the one on the left is a, this is a throwback. Sorry, this screen has updated. You're still showing the mountain. Uh, I've still oh, oh, never mind. You're, you're showing me. Uh, okay, cool. All right. So, um, as I say, my internet here is not great. If people start, if I start having problems, I'll swap over to my uh, phone tether just in case. So let me know. <laughs> okay. So, so we've established that maybe like humans have to be involved somehow. All right. Humans definitely made both of these. Um, the one on the left is what's called a molecular beam epitaxy machine. Um, it allows you to uh, use basically lasers to build materials atom by atom. Uh, and the one on the right is uh, the depiction of the electron clouds around an atom. All right, anyone want to make a case for why these things are and aren't art, are or aren't art? If you're a physicist, the left one definitely is. If you're an astronomer, the right one, oh boy. Uh, okay, so, so, so you think to a physicist this is art? I think if you understand the complexity of its creation and the underlying just process of creating that, it is similar to the artistic process. Uh, so I would say to some people it can qualify. But also yeah. the fact that it has mainly a functional role um, can be used as a counter argument that it probably... Yeah, so, so this, is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to get across in this slide, is that maybe even if we think the thing on the left has some aesthetic value, um, maybe you, you think it looks cool or whatever, but I assure you every single piece of that thing, uh, it costs over one and a half million pounds, every single piece of it was arranged to maximize the efficiency and to meet its engineering needs. Uh, similarly, the diagram on the right, maybe you think it looks nice, but uh, it, its primary purpose, I think it was created uh, to be informative um, from a scientific perspective. Um, I think reasonably most people would not understand either of these as art, maybe they would say that they have artistic or aesthetic qualities, but they would not think of art when when these are shown to them. Um, this is not. I'm trying to admit someone into the waiting room, but it's not actually working. So if anyone can do anything about that, uh, oh, All right, okay. Uh, so then let, let, let's look at some other people's definitions of art. Let, let's move away then from sort of just the, probing the boundaries of our intuition. The Oxford Dictionary says. The expression or application of creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting, drawing, or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Uh, that's like quite expansive, I suppose. Um, I think it covers lots and lots of different things. Um, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, I personally, I think he's, he was an architect. I think he was massively overrated, um, but uh, whatever. Uh, he says, art is the discovery and the development of elementary principles of nature into beautiful forms suitable for human use. So, so the word beauty seems to have come up twice now. Uh, we've got Tolstoy, who, who thinks that it's about feeling, um, the transmission of feeling. And then we've got uh, Picasso, who, who thinks art is a lie that makes us realize the truth, which I really, I really love that one because it's so vague. It means basically anything, um, but, it, but, but it somehow sounds really profound, which is... Uh, um, very Picasso. Anyway, um, so this is my definition. And this is the definition I think will be most useful to you unless you really want to get into the weeds of the philosophy. But in terms of debates, if you start with this definition, um, you will get a lot of mileage. And, and I'm going to explain why this definition I think is so powerful and why it covers everything that is important for the discussion of art. It's anything created, note the word created, with intent, now, this is where we go back to the discussion we had earlier of a uh, human needing to be involved. But I said it doesn't necessarily have to be human, but I think there does have to be intent, right? Um, and the intent is to provoke an emotional response in the viewer or the consumer, I guess we could say in the more general sense, although I think that to me that sounds a little bit icky, it implies economics, really would just mean anyone who's interacting with the art. So it could be the, the listener as well, right? So we have, let me, let me illustrate where, how this works. Is uh, anyone want to argue that this uh, plastic folding table is art? Anyone? No one want to try and make a devil's advocate case for, for this plastic folding table being art? All right. I think according what about to this? Uh, 
What, what about this uh, hairpin uh, wooden table? Hairpin leg wooden, uh, wooden yeah. hairpin leg wooden top table. All right, I'm not, I'm not gonna actually gonna get your answers, but I think people would start to feel more like, I'm sure someone can come up with a clever explanation of why the, the first one was art. This one, I think people start to feel a little bit more comfortable about uh, maybe arguing that this might be considered art. Um, and I think at this point, we're, we're relatively unambiguous. Uh, I feel like very few people would dispute that this last table is artwork. Uh, and yet they're all the same thing, right? They're, they're all functionally a surface that holds up objects. They're all a table. Uh, and yet somehow, somewhere along this transition, we've become artwork. What changed? The person who made the first one wanted a table that you could stick in the back of the car, take on a picnic and eat off. And they didn't care about anything else. It just needed to be cheap and do the job. The middle one, this obviously, they want it to look good. They want it to fit into a room. Um, you know, they, they want it to be, to make a statement, you know, stylistic. The last one is something far more. It's like, you know, this is like a real, in, this is probably a one-off item, right? This, this ingenuity went into this. They were, they were challenging some of the concepts that, that we understand of as being fundamental to a table. Like, no, technically a hole in the middle doesn't stop it being a table. But it's very unusual to see a table with a hole in the middle. Um, they've, they've somehow sacrificed the functionality, but in the doing so, they've created something that, that is special. So, uh, what they did and what changed as we went, oops, as we went along this axis um, of tables is that they wanted an emotional response to occur in the person who saw the viewer and that emotional response, what they wanted was an aesthetic appreciation of beauty. All right. So that's why, uh, for example, uh, these things probably aren't considered art because they were created with intent, but the intent was to either perform a function uh, or, or to communicate information. Someone, someone said something? Or, sorry, is someone talking? Okay. Um, now, obviously I couldn't, uh, and the mountain range similarly was not created with intent. It has beauty, it provokes an emotional response, but that wasn't the, the, the intent. I don't think, if we, even if we can see that mother nature uh, as a concept exists, uh, it's unclear to me that she, um, you know, has a specific plan for the universe. Um, so that therefore kind of breaks down the process of art into, or, or turns art into a process, not necessarily any object, right? It's three things. And, and this encompasses a lot of the discussion that we had earlier. It's the artist, so that's, that's the intent or the origin of the artwork. Uh, it's the process of creation, uh, skill, innovation enters here. Um, and lastly, it's the reception. So someone you know, alluded to the idea that it's art if I think it's art, um, which is valid, and that's happening in your mind, it's in how you receive the art, it's in how you interpret the art. That word interpret is gonna become very important. We're gonna talk about that a lot. So um, does anyone disagree with my, let me, let me uh, jump back a second. Does anyone disagree with this definition? Does anyone have any holes that they wanna poke in it? Feel free to type them out, feel free to unmute yourself in chat. Um, I want to illustrate another couple of other things. One thing that people t tend to think about art, I'm going to talk about this in the cognitive account, is that they think it needs to be thought provoking. Um, and I disagree because a academic article is thought provoking. It's informative, but it's not art, right? Like a scientific paper or, or a textbook about astronomy or something like that, right? It can have elements of beauty contained within it, but broadly speaking, its intent was to be informative. So um, is anyone gonna challenge this definition? Because if not, we're gonna press on with it. Awesome. Means I, uh, uh, I got a, sorry, sorry. So I see someone else just joined, so I'm just gonna backtrack because we've reached a rather pivotal moment in the lecture. This is the definition of artwork for the purposes of this lecture, uh, pending uh, mute yourself, whoever just joined. If you're, can whoever just joined mute themselves, please? Or whoever it is that's unmuted. Cool. Um, all right. So the uh, definition of art is anything created with intent to provoke an emotional response in the viewer. All right. And then that means that we now need to think of art as a process with three components necessary. There has to be an artist, someone who grants intent to the creation, uh, to, to the artwork. There has to be a process of creation. Um, it can't simply be something I find, perhaps. Um, and lastly, there has to be reception. The person viewing it has to experience it in a way 
that, in, that, that merits the understanding or the conception of an artistic experience. So let's next talk about what makes art valuable. Um, and the first one, and perhaps the most intuitive one, and, and while it's not actually the original one, it's the, the most intuitive one, I think, is what's called the aesthetic response. And, and this refers to um, an experience rooted in the concept of beauty or taste. Uh, and the two do uh, exist in tandem because what is beautiful is obviously a matter of taste. Um, and or equally, it may not even be necessary that we appreciate something because we think that it's beautiful, but because it aligns with our taste. So you think perhaps like maybe um, someone dresses in a certain way because they feel like, you know, they talk about how it matches their aesthetic, um, but that's because they feel like it's an expression of themselves. So they don't necessarily want it to be beautiful. Um, a lot of artwork, in fact, isn't beautiful. Uh, it, 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 like if anyone heard, I wish I had an example here actually of uh, Hieronymus Bosch, who uh, did, did paintings of hell. They're, they're horrifying to look at, they're, like truly disturbing. Very definitely artwork though. Um, and as I say, this, this coheres with our understanding of artwork because the majority of artwork that we interact with is beautiful. And so there's this notion, sorry, there's a lot of noises coming out of Zoom. I don't know if anyone can do anything about that. Um, a lot of our interaction with artwork centers around the idea uh, or, or of beauty or of positive aesthetic qualities. So we say things like, ah, oh, wow, isn't that painting beautiful? Or you would hear a singer and, you know, I love the sound of her voice or, you know, this drawing is so lifelike. Maybe that one is not str strictly speaking about positive aestheticism, but about representation, which will become important in the next slide actually, um, or et cetera. So therefore th this account of aesthetics says that the more beautiful a piece is, um, the more we will value it. Now, obviously, this doesn't cover all of art because there's a lot of artwork, as I've said, that it's not beautiful, um, that it can be haunting, it can be jarring, uh, it can be uh, disturbing. Um, all of those can still be encompassed within the idea of good art or art that is valuable. So then they have the, the formalist theory of art, which asserts that we should focus only on the form of art and that the content is actually less important. Now, what they mean by the form is, is this goes back to the idea of when we say good art, what we mean is something to do with skilled art. So we say like Beethoven is a great musician because his music is incredibly complex and is like the composition of it is incredibly intelligent, it harmonizes in a beautiful manner. Um, but, but it's not just the beauty of it, it's the skill that went into creating it. Or, or you know, a painting is better if it is more lifelike. That's what formalists would say. It originates from Immanuel Kant, the, the, the same one. Um, and, and it is the, the idea that it's the spatial organization, like the composition of the piece um, it, it is what makes it good art. And therefore the more skillful a piece of art is, uh, the more valuable we ought to consider it. And this one, I think, while it was sort of more primal in terms of the, the sort of evolution of humanity's thinking of art, it is probably the least intuitive one because I, I think um, there's a lot of art that people think is great that is just not particularly skillful, um, i.e. most pop, right? There's a lot of niche uh, indie or like, you know, very like avant-garde artists who are creating very intensely skillful art that is not getting nearly the positive reception that a lot of like, you know, whatever the top 40 is in your country is. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, or, or the fact, you know, that Twilight has sold more copies than any number of better books. Better here, of course, being a subjective value judgment. So then, then, you, then you have the, uh, the cognitive theory of art. Uh, and then this, I, I wrote less about this one because because uh, I don't think this one is one that will be too difficult to grasp for debaters, but it's essentially just the idea that art has value because of the ideas that go behind it. Um, the, the, and that when we say that a piece of artwork is good, what we're valuing is the, the ingenuity or perhaps the, the timeliness, the relevance to the moment, uh, perhaps the, the, because the artwork is radical, it probes an idea that you know, has, never, has never occurred to us before or challenges the norm. Um, uniqueness enters into the cognitive theory of artwork, right? We, we, we value uniqueness when someone has come up with something uh, new. So then we would say that art could be considered valuable by virtue of its cognitive power, how much it makes us think. Um, I, I'm a big fan of this, uh, uh, not painting, print, I guess, digital artwork or whatever on the right. Um, because I think it's very, it's a very clever subversion. So this was the timeliness of this was shortly after the Trump election, um, and it, it, it takes two concepts that, to perhaps to a lot of Americans, are irreconcilable. 
uh, the hijab and the American flag and puts them together in, in a sort of what shouldn't be a juxtaposition, but probably to a lot of people feels like a juxtaposition. Um, it creates a very striking piece, but the appreciation of it is very little down to um, the aesthetic. I mean, it, it, I think it is a rather well-drawn piece, but it's probably, I wouldn't describe it as the most beautiful piece of artwork I've ever seen. Um, furthermore, formalism here is a little bit ambiguous because it's a digital drawing. So actually a lot less skill went into this than a lot of other drawings. But in terms of its, its cognitive value, I would say it's pretty high. Um, this painting on the right here, though, this is interesting because in some sense, uh, it breaks down all three concepts. Um, firstly, we have a more formalist aspect to this painting down here at the bottom. This is a pretty good, pretty lifelike depiction of a church. Um, we have what might be considered an, an aesthetic response up here. I, I personally find something very visually appealing about this you know, mess of, of, of lines and of colour and of pattern. I, I like the discordance, the sort of irrationality of it. And then we have the cognitive account, which kind of says, that, well, there's a, there's a sort of juxtaposition going on in this painting, isn't there? There's this clearly sort of very classical, um, traditionally painted watercolour down here, and then there's this like, crazy psychedelic pattern origin from the spire, like what does it mean? Why have the two been put together? Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I've forgotten, it's, it's the illustration cover of a book, but, um, nice, there we go, cool, it did load, yeah. Um, so this, I think, aligns with what essentially mine is, which uh, I, I didn't come up with, I just rephrased into a simpler phrase from um, the philosopher Israel Zangville, who, um, I'm not going to read it out, it's like, it's kind of a mess of uh, intellectual language, but if you pick it apart, um, it tells you that what we ought value about art is the composition of intent, how well it fulfills that intent, then the artistic vision, and the context in which it exists. All three should be included as a holistic process in terms of evaluating art. So this is a good piece of art because it, it, it accomplished lots of things. It made us think, and probably it made us think in exactly the way that the, the, the artist wanted us to think, which was to notice the jarring contrast between the sort of uh, modernist, abstract, psychedelic aspect of the painting up here and the sort of more classical fine art down here. All right, um, how do we value art then? And this is gonna move in more into sort of the analytical sphere and now get us back to debating and less away from philosophy. So the first thing is I want you to partition art into two components. Um, Actually, before we go on, just because I've covered a lot of material there, does anyone have any um, questions they want to raise at this point or any comments they want to make or whatever? Okay, just feel free to unmute yourself at any point. All right, so let's partition art into its two components. And this might seem counterintuitive at first, but I'm going to explain to you that they are indeed distinct, entirely distinct things, connected in a, in a, in a specific way. We have the form of the art, and we have the interpretation of art. And from that, we can counterintuitively, or maybe it's not counterintuitive after the discussion we've just had, but I think it, it might be counterintuitive when you ask people who've not thought about this before. But actually, rather than considering art and its value in terms of a single component, what if we broke it down into two components? We talked about the formative value and the interpretive value. And I'll explain what those are. So the formative value is the aspect of the artwork that we physically interact with. Right? It's the, the physical form, that's where it comes from. Um, the strokes on the canvas, the, the, the less on the page, the, you know, the, every, everything that you could uh, see, touch, or otherwise interact with about the artwork, um, you know, when you know, auditory interaction would be included here, the point is there is a tangible aspect to the artwork, right? And from this, we, we, can, um, we can start to value the form in, in a sort of more reductionist way. So we can talk about how um, the, form of, the formative value of a piece of artwork is elevated by virtue of the skill of its composition or its beauty. Um, and, and this aspect of the artwork maybe doesn't change with time because society can change, the viewer can change, the artist could change, um, but, but the value of the physical form of the artwork is unchanging because it is fixed into its physical structure. But what about the interpretive value? Well, loosely speaking, this is everything else. It's 
the history, the context, the the intent, the the discourse. You know that the the, the least useful of all debating, what one of the most least useful. Um, but that just means like you know the discussions that happened around it, all of the pieces of knowledge that you have about that piece of artwork before you even see it or hear it or interact with it or read it or whatever. You know the meaning. Um, and, and by thinking about artwork in terms of our interpretation of it, we can begin to consider its value or even just to, to value it in a, in a very useful way from an analytical perspective. And I think why this uh, is such an important, creating this distinction between the two is so important is because it solves a lot of the problems that come when valuing art um, relating to things like cultural relativism, uh, forgery or, or obscenity um, by saying that, well, those things can affect the quality of the, of the art independently of the form itself so if i've timed this no i haven't okay what i wanted to do was discuss um the mona lisa so uh ha has anyone here been to paris been to the louvre and seen the mona lisa just like i can't see the cameras but um just someone chime up if if they have all right unmute yourself what what, what did you think? What did I think? Um, just regular painting. Very, very protected. Like, obviously, a lot of effort was put into uh, placing in a safe space. A lot of people are there to appreciate it. Uh, so that's my take. Just, just yeah. regular painting. Yeah. It, and that, that, that's honestly the, the remarkable thing, right? It is a regular painting. And, and the rational part of your brain probably knew that before you went there. And uh, you probably you'd also, I don't know, maybe you had or hadn't, but a lot of people's first remark when they go and see it is, oh, wow, it's tiny. It's like really, it's, it's really very small. Um, so, why do, so why do people go and see it? Then? They know it's a painting. They, they've seen photos of it. Why, why, why does people care so much? Well, it's because the, the value of the Mona Lisa is, is actually... Um, there's people in the waiting room, by the way. The value of the Mona Lisa as a painting actually is almost nothing to do with the form itself. It, it, it's a fine painting, you know, it, it's, a, it's pretty good. It's not the best painting that's ever been painted, though. It doesn't even crack the top 10 in most, in, in most cases, right? Um, um, like skill-wise. Skill Sorry, someone, someone said something? Yeah, I, I had a... I, do people want to feel something and because of the context created around these paintings, they perhaps go to these places to see them in order to feel that way. Yeah, exactly. So also I realized I've rambled for too long because it's nearly 40 minutes now, so I'm gonna to start to speed up a little bit. Um, yeah, so the story of the Mona Lisa is what people are going to experience. They wanna experience the history of it. They wanna, you know, the, the legend of Leonardo da Vinci, this polymath who, you know, invented all these things as well as being a brilliant artist. They, they hear all the quirks about it. Oh, she doesn't have any eyebrows, etc. The point is the experience is actually very little to do with the form. Um, it's mostly about the, 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 the interpretation that we have of the Mona Lisa, the history, the context, the discussion that happened around it. In some sense, that's what we're experiencing. The painting itself is nothing more than a vehicle for um, the, 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 the experiential value of the artwork there, right? So in terms of debating, I don't know if my screen is transitioning on time, but we can discuss the formative value of artwork by treating it identically to other objects. There's intellectual property, legal property, whatever. But the interpretation of the, uh, of the artwork is where we, we start to target the really rich analysis in terms of these motions. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is uh, the interplay between the two is the form of value is meaningful only if it exists to facilitate or modify access to the interpretive value. Um, why is that important? Because if you found out that the Mona Lisa had been stolen six months ago uh, and replaced with a fake that was only distinguishable to like an art expert, I reckon a lot less people would bother go. I actually think almost no one would want to go because once you know it's a fake, the form, the original form of the Mona Lisa, has become separated from, from the interpretation for you because you know that's not the real Mona Lisa anymore and that the, the actual richness of the experience that the thing you valued, which was the interpretation, the story, the myth, is gone because the original form isn't there anymore, right? And this is why separating and understanding the two allows us to answer what is a very difficult question in the philosophy of art, which is, 
why do we value a forgery less? If anything, a forgery can be, the forgery of a famous painting can be harder to make than the original, and yet somehow we value it less. So clearly it's not just the skill, um, and it's not even, it, and, and maybe there you can start to see why the intent matters as well. Um, because maybe with the Mona Lisa it's a bit different, but with the other paintings, if you know that it's the original, you know that this is the original artistic vision and intent of the artist. When it's a forgery, you know that this person you know, engaged in crime and, and you know, tried to deceive and manipulate you in order to profit. And that intent changes the interpretation of the artwork in a way that makes you enjoy it less. Um, so here's, a, here's an example motion for you guys. Uh, this house believes that artists should not publicly participate in ongoing discussion of the meaning and themes behind their artwork. And as I said, uh, I'm gonna you know, was, like, have a quick think about this, but I'm just gonna briefly break down some of the ways um, in which we can sort of apply what we've just discussed to this. So let's say that artists don't engage in, pub in discussion of their work. What that means is, let's say it's a book, um, like maybe some of you read Kafka or any author who writes in a very vague way, or, or like you have a song and the lyrics aren't clearly painting like a definitive story, they're just a little bit vague. And in your mind, that song means something, it has some association to you. You've constructed uh, an interpretation of it in your mind that has some sort of emotive value to you. If the artist then came, and critically, right, it's not just you, it's thousands of people, millions of people potentially, all of them in their mind have a picture of what that song means that is special and is valuable to them. If the artist then comes out and says, so I like, there's a good case, there's a good example of this. I can't remember, there's one of the Beatles songs that people have like thought was about like all these like deep uh, concepts. And then they came out and were just like, oh yeah, no, we were just high on acid and, and like writing nonsense down. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and in a split second, that interpretation that existed in the minds of every single person is shattered and destroyed because no one can claim to know what the art stands for more than the person who created it because it was their intent that, that, that put it into practice. And as a consequence, um, by doing so, by, by weighing in, even if their interpretation, even if the, the, their contribution was intellectually interesting in of itself, they've replaced what were thousands of uniquely valuable interpretations with a single one, which is unlikely to be so personally meaningful to all those individual people. Um, there, there's other reasons uh, that we might uh, have, such as, uh, again, I don't know how quickly the video is loading, but there should be a photo of JK Rowling in front of you. Um, other times we might just make some more simplistic arguments, like sometimes their interpretations are just stupid compared to the narrative that the public has constructed around them. Um, but if we're not, what we might say is, and this would be perhaps more of a principled argument, because um, the first one, despite using philosophical language, is actually quite utilitarian when you think about it, right? There was this much enjoyment created by a song until the artist weighed in and, and said, oh, no, it's about this, and now a lot of people enjoy it. A, that little bit less because it does, it's no longer special to them. Um, but there's a principle claim that goes back to the idea, our idea, which says that the artist had an intent, right? They wanted to create a specific emotion in you, and presumably they wanted that emotion to accomplish some objective. And if that objective and if that intent has been perverted through public discourse, because it is theirs, because they're the ones who put their identity, their emotions, and their priorities into that piece of artwork, they have the right to reclaim it, because your interpretation you could argue is less valuable than theirs. So uh, again, uh, um, hopefully it loads soon. Um, I had a question. Yeah, can I just finish this point and then I'll answer your question, yeah. Um, so uh, Pepe the Frog has uh, long been a staple of 4chan meme culture uh, and as 4chan was rather intentionally take that, they were always pretty racist, let's be fair. But um, Basically, Pepe the Frog became uh, an unwitting symbol of white supremacy and the French artist who um, uh, like originally drew him as a character for a children's book was pretty damn pissed and has been pretty vocal and come out on uh, multiple news channels and discussion things to try and tell people, no, please don't use my cute frog picture for your neo-Nazi causes. Um, that makes me rather unhappy. So trying to reclaim the artwork, you might argue, is a principal right of artists uh, to ensure that their artwork is being interpreted in a way that is what they wanted. 
what was the question? So if the artist um, says that the things I've wrote in the song are just nonsense and I, uh, he didn't intend to uh, make uh, feelings ar arise in people, so that doesn't make his art, uh, art any an art anymore as he has no intention to do so? Yeah, I mean, you, you can, that, that, that is an interesting observation. Um, maybe the, the artwork becomes divorced from the original artist. Like it's somehow transcended and, and um, it's moved into like the sphere of public discourse and therefore is no longer really, doesn't really belong to, I'm actually gonna talk about that later. Um, but practically speaking for the majority of people, um, they would find it hard to continue believing that deep attachment or that deep interpretation they had of what the song if the artist came out and just said it was nonsense. Um, but, but of course, you know, these are debates, right? There's no clear cut answers. So, um, um, I had a question. Yeah, go for it. So how does intellectual property rights um, for these artists work in this system where they do own the property, they like the artwork and they do own um, how it's to be used or so on, but how it's to be interpreted is should it be distanced from them? So does it endanger their property rights, their intellectual property rights? Uh, yeah, so there's an, in, there's an interesting intersection there of sort of more principled arguments and legal arguments, which is the public interpretation of your art affects the value of it. And so if I turn your famous piece of artwork into a symbol of neo-Nazism, probably you're gonna struggle to make money off it. Uh, so yes, th this is what I said at the beginning, which is that sometimes the interplay of more practical argumentation and more philosophical argumentation can occur. Um, it's just that uh, that's outside the scope of this lecture. Um, but yes, that, that, that is a good observation and a good way of connecting and reconciling the two, which will of course become important if you're trying to, for example, whip a more um, practical case against one of those more intangible principled cases or vice versa. Okay, so now let's talk about form. So sorry, uh, form does question. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so it's a bit, bit off track, but can I, I still don't understand what form basically means. Is it the resources that the artist is going to use? Let's say just the pages or the uh, text in general in a vacuum that exists. Because according to what I understand is the form cannot exist alone. It's always an interpretive value that is assorted to it. So even if you read it with dull brain or with like nothing in mind, there are certain biases or certain interpretive value that you attach to it as a reader, as, as an interpreter. It cannot exist in a standalone quality. But still, I think that's the question of for whom art is generally created for. So even taking the example of Picasso, what is art turned out about to be or Roald Dahl, which people might associate their childhood with, but are actually sexist, racist people are turned out to be. So my question is basically, doesn't the reader or the interpreter actually make the art except for the artist? So it's not a holistic view that the form exists or relies on the artist alone. I'm so sorry if that's confusing. Uh, I, I think I got the gist, and I think I think you're. Uh, it is a little confusing, but that's because I think the concepts here are confusing, um, and maybe that's you know maybe I should be explaining them better. Um, so the form, I, I, I disagree with one part of what you said. The form can exist without anyone interpreting it, right? If I take a painting and I go and put it in a locked vault, shut the door, throw away the key, the art still exists, um, but uh, but no one is experiencing it, right? the the it, it it does but it does definitely does still exist like i know it's in there right it's just no one is seeing it right so art can exist in its purely formative form you get what i'm saying um but yeah but like as i said at the beginning the the process is important and and really for something to be art there has to be the person interpreting it so yes the two are in interlink the two cannot truly be divorced um, but if you know that th if you have an interpretation associated with one piece of artwork uh, and then you get told that's actually not the thing that you thought it was, as is in the case of forgery, for example, um, it, it breaks your interpretation because psychologically you still attach that physical form to the emotive content, uh, like to, to the story that you have around the artwork. Um, we'll, we'll delve into some more of these concepts a little bit later. So anyway, let, let's now talk about why form matters. Uh, and because thus far the discussion maybe suggests that art can look like anything as long as 
as long as it has a good intent or a good story or whatever. Um, clearly, this is not true, though, as my paint diagram of um, Lady Liberty storming the Bastille uh, indicates. Uh, qualitatively, these are both paintings of Lady Liberty storming the Bastille. Practically speaking, though, one of these made you feel a very specific emotion, and the other one made you feel a different emotion, which was probably humour, um, because this is obviously pretty crap. So form matters. Why does form matter? Because firstly, even under the cognitive account, i.e. The, the value of something being in the, the intellectual ideas within it, if the form isn't appropriate, then it just distracts us from the intention. Um, and secondly, if the work is without even any intended form, like if it, if it is just randomness, um, then can, it, can, like, can we value it? Can, some, it goes back to the idea. So yes, if an, if an artist like, you know, throws paint at a canvas and you go and look at it and go, hmm, oh, it's really interesting. It makes me, think of, makes me think of death, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, you, you've gained a good experience from it, but I'm, I would argue that a good experience is not artistic in nature um, because it's really indistinguishable from, you know, the mountain range or a variety of other things. Um, however, uh, you know, you can argue both sides of this because maybe their intention was to create something chaotic in order to challenge your conception of art. Now I'm gonna skip over this question just because I wanna uh, try and move ahead on time. But what I want to get across here is that the form of artwork and the quality in which it's made still matters because uh, it needs, the form needs to be appropriate to the message and, and to what it intends uh, to convey. And now that hopefully, uh, you know, deals with something which probably is not super important but is worth covering. Um, let's now move on to how interpretation changes the value of art. Um, because the narratives that surround artwork uh, change your perception of it, uh, which is related to the fact that the value of artwork is not constant. Um, so what makes art unique, as we've said initially in, the, in our first discussion, is that it has something to do with reflecting our sense of self. So like probably a lot of you have the experience of a lot of your friends sharing the same music tastes as you. And in some sense, this is quite weird when you think about it, right? Music is a very personal thing. Why is it that people who have similar music tastes often tend to associate with one another? Um, well, because in some sense, it's an expression of ourselves and in the sense that our mindset affects how we interpret art. Um, so people with a similar mindset to us will also interpret it in a similar way. Um, but it's also when we, because our identity is in some sense linked to our work we create as well, uh, it also imbues it with a, a separate set of value because the judgment of artwork becomes a judgment of ourselves. So if your friend says your hair looks messy today, you kind of feel like that's something that is out of your control, perhaps. You know, you maybe feel a little bit self-conscious, but it would not necessarily feel like, I would imagine for most people, if you've ever done any serious amount of art, um, it wouldn't feel like a, you know, a deep attack on your fundamental being. So the story that goes around a piece of art takes it from that aesthetic account, from just the, 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 the appreciation of the visual form into the intellectual appreciation. So we've talked about the Mona Lisa and how it's a relatively unremarkable painting until you know the giant legacy and like story that goes along it. Uh, or another example that I think is, is particularly interesting is um, those of you listen to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Um, it's a very incredibly good album. Uh, and then when you learn that it's them writing and venting their emotions about the gradual decline into insanity of the, their, their previous guitarist, um, it takes on a, a, like a much bigger level. And I think this is probably what, despite being in, in like one of the most incredible pieces of music ever written, and if you've not listened to this album, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, uh, someone stick it in the chat if anyone's curious. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible piece of music, um, but probably what's elevated it into being one of the, considered to be one of the greatest albums ever, is the fact that it's wrapped in this like incredibly rich story um, of, you know, suffering and friendship and, and, and like mental health and so on. No, the first I, I was going to play you a piece of audio there, but I'm going to move on for time. Okay, um, now let's talk about where interpretation and form meet with one another, because thus far I've talked about form as a facilitating vehicle largely through the idea of beauty or, or, or appropriateness. 
what if the form is intended to do the opposite? What if the form is meant to be distasteful? So does anyone know what the thing in the top right is? Unmute yourself and tell me what, what This is the urinal by the Dadaist movements that went political. Uh, I, uh, political and it was rejected and I think that was a very great victory. I was thinking about this movement during the question, does art impact? So the absurdist movements that went political and was used to make political statements. I think that is political. Yeah. Uh, you, pretty, you're pretty close, yeah. Um, it wasn't that uh, uh, it was... So, 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 okay, I'll just tell the story because I'm, I'm, I'm not so well versed in the history of, of modernist art mu movement uh, to, to say that it wasn't the absurdists, but I think this came before that. Um, so there's a guy called Duchamp who... Uh, the story is a little bit uncertain, but basically he was pretty pissed off with the fine art establishment of his era where you had paint things that were really like beautifully accurate. And instead uh, he signed his name, actually it's not his name, it's a pseudonym, but signed his, uh, a, a urinal and put it on the plinth in, in like a big art gallery surrounded by all these like fine classical paintings and sculptures and so on. Um, and as you might imagine, it's pretty much all anyone talked about because they were like, how the hell did he sign your rhino end up here in an art gallery? Is this art? Uh, and this became the first piece of what we now know to be contemporary art um, in the sense that uh, it challenged the idea that art had to be beautiful or had to be representative of things. And instead, simply, as long as the form, as I said, cr was created with the intent to provoke an emotional response, and that process is, is dependent on context as well as the form, um, in this case, the form being a urinal and the context being a fine art exhibition, when you put the two together, it created a new cognitive experience, which was what the hell is going on? Confusion. Um, and that therefore sparked the idea that art could be something more. Similarly, uh, again, it, it's extremely distasteful to me, but the, the brutalist architectural movement um, was uh, a rejection of the long-standing idea that architecture was something that should make people feel happy, that they should enjoy, so that they felt pride in their environment, and instead said, no, the, 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 uh, what's the guys, what did he say? Um, the buildings are a via, uh, uh, sorry, uh, buildings are just machines for living, um, and that they should just be constructed uh, to, to fill, fulfill their functional form, and this in, somehow became like an artistic appreciation there's people who will defend brutalism i think they're mentally ill but that's that's a topic for another discussion um so the form doesn't have I to had be a beautiful. Question. yeah uh does it. this under does this underlay the point of aesthetic where art has to be for beauty uh so it's a, it's, it's kind of a undermining that idea like that was a long-standing idea throughout almost the entirety of human history and it's one that's kind of fallen away in, in recent years um, the idea that art has to be beautiful or has to be even aesthetic so, in the sense of like representing something, you, you know, with a, with a pleasant form is kind of been challenged. So if something, if, if an art, a piece of art gives universally a negative emotion or uh, brings out a negative emotion, um, is that still justified considering um, like, for example, public well-being or just any um, you know, being like considerate of someone else other than yourself. So or does it, go it, it, it can still be good art because good art doesn't mean enjoyable art or it doesn't need to mean enjoyable art. If it gets people, I mean, this is when we're going to talk about how art changes the world. If it gets people talking, it gets people thinking, or if it challenges them, it can still be considered good art. Um, if the intent was to make you feel uncomfortable, as I imagine anyone who designed this building. This is actually a um, like social housing apartment block in London. Um, I can't imagine that the architect's vision wasn't, and I know it was because he wrote about it, was to make people feel small and insignificant as they walk towards it. Um, and if it accomplishes that, if the intent was to make people feel small and insignificant and hot, like, like they're in a hostile environment, and it accomplishes that emotional response, well then, in some sense, the artist has succeeded and therefore we would say that it's good art. And this is independently of beauty. Uh, I'm going to skip past this bit because uh, it was a discussion. Actually, I will talk about this one quickly. Um, 
interpretation and the artist. Let's loop back a little bit. We said that there has to be an artist for something uh, to be art, and perhaps who the artist is might matter. So does anyone want to give me any random thoughts they have about these two, both, I would say, skill-wise, pretty mediocre watercolours? Which one was made by Hitler? Nico, you're, you're cheating. Uh, I feel like you've seen this before, or maybe this is just too, it's probably too cliche. Yes, one of these was painted by Hitler. Can anyone guess which one? I would give it a wild shot and say the left one. The left it one, was yes. the left, yeah. Uh, the one on the left was painted by Hitler. Uh, but, it, but this is interesting, right? Because it's like, neither of them has anything um, immediately viscerally negative about it. But once you know that the one on the left was painted by Hitler, um, you probably wouldn't want to hang out on your wall. Uh, you you probably don't enjoy looking at it as much. You're every, now when you look at it, the the appreciation of the artwork has, I imagine, um, been like overridden by the the thought. No, it, it, yeah, the comment is right. Sorry, I'm only half reading the chat, but yeah, ni neither of them is particularly Hitlery. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly fascist about either of them. Um, but if you're looking at the one on the left, now your interpretation has been somewhat hijacked by the knowledge. Um, that, that Hitler drew it. Uh, you know, we can discuss what that means, but it's important to always remember when you're thinking about the value of artwork through the lens of its interpretation is that the person who creates art colors our interpretation of art. And, and that might be irrational, but it is nonetheless a, a feature. Okay, uh, I quickly wanted to talk about who owns art because this is something that goes back to a question that was asked earlier, but also it's a very important intersection. We typically assume that, uh, you know, the person who makes art owns art until they sell it. But that's firstly a, a very capitalist way of thinking about things. And I've, I'm not a Marxist, so I have no problem with it. Um, my problem with it is not economic or, or even ideological. My problem with it um, is philosophical. Because if, let, let, so the example I traditionally use is, um, let's say uh, you have a a piece of jewelry and it's just I don't know a necklace and it's probably worth I don't know people might be willing to pay some amount of money for it um now if you and, and that money is its value right in like in terms of the, the the actual object but if it was if if it was then used by like a tribe in a very sacred religious rite for over 300 years passed down from generation to generation from priest to priest um and then somehow you know a archaeologist has acquired it or sorry anthropologist has acquired it or whatever and tells you that and probably then people would be willing to pay a lot more for it um because it has a story as a legacy as a rich culture to the to even if it's the, the, the two are in theory the same necklace now then the question becomes well why does the artist own it or why would the original artist own it when now most of what makes it valuable what make most of what makes people appreciate it or want to own it was not created by the artist. It was created by the people who engaged in that kind of discursive process or, or in this case, like spiritual engagement with the item. All the people who collectively participated in those religious ceremonies, they created the value of it. And the reason why I think this is important is a lot of debates that talk about cultural ownership of art and whether or not people, you know, art, uh, frequent schools debate in the UK, I don't know what it's like in, you know, wherever you guys are coming from, but. Um, is that the British Museum should return uh, historical artworks that were acquired through colonialism, such as the Elgin marbles. Um, uh, there's, uh, so, so then, you know, you can make arguments like the British Museum is the best equipped point in all of the world uh, to maintain ancient artifacts. Um, London is one of the most visited cities on the globe, and if you want people to see the Elgin marbles, if you care about their appreciation of their beauty, um, you know, then it's a pretty good place to put it. Equally, I, <laughs> we can be certain that the sculptor who created the Elgin marbles, as well as anyone who could have bought them, are long since dead. So why would the, why does it make sense to return them to, to the Greek people? Well, because Greek culture and the, the collective work of the people uh, who formed that culture um, is really what made them valuable, right? The, the, they were elevated to a, a point of cultural significance 
by the culture and therefore all of those people have had some input into making it valuable and so it makes some sort of sense for them to have some claim to ownership of it just as much as the artist um uh, can i ask a question this, yeah go for it sure what do people say about say china where they have many historical artifacts but then china obviously went for many revolutions so maybe they could just say that china of today doesn't resemble at all but of what china was before so therefore the cultural claim doesn't really stand uh, rather than delving into what is a very long, lengthy and interesting discussion, I'm going to respond with a quip, which is, what is China but its people? Um, and if you think about that, then the, if the argument was the CCP is a different entity to you know, the historical Chinese empire, maybe, but the, the people who occupy China are still descendants of the people who existed in that previous state the change in governance seems like a weak justification to deny the culture which is something that endures and lives through the legacy of its people it seems weird to deny them access to their something they own something that was literally stolen from them if we if, we, if you believe the analysis that by virtue of their cultural contribution they created the value of the art through interpretation in the same way as you inherit property of your parents it seems that like you should inherit cultural ownership of artwork perhaps yeah. Uh, yeah. obviously that's not an airtight argument that's why it can be a debate um but let's move past that because as i say it's, uh, it's i want to try and keep this under two hours um I, I mean and i would love to rent for the whole two hours but i feel like i'll lose people's attention and we've still got some important material to get through uh a cultural appropriation um that is uh, a, a sort of pretty big culture wars issue uh people who say that cultural appropriation doesn't exist or doesn't matter. People who say that, uh, you know, um, maybe, maybe some people are a bit over eager in assigning cultural appropriation. So let's break down why this is even a discussion, why there's even any merit to it, why the idea has endured in any form. Well, because your culture is another way of saying the interpretation you have of the things that are in, uh, incorporated uh, within you know the artistic discussion, so the 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 you know Madonna appropriating like um, I believe it was like Native American symbology. Well, these things, given that they have clearly been created for a non-functional purpose, are intended to elicit an emotional response in the people who who participate in them. Uh, someone's asking, what does all this have to do with debating? Uh, as I said uh, at the very start of this lecture, but uh, it's better to understand a topic. Uh, than for me to give you a list of arguments. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so um, the cultural interpretation of, of artwork changes when other people uh, participate in it. So um, the transformation of, of, you know, early blues that was very much like, you know, African-American cultural tradition um, of like instruments created from what they could get to try and like preserve as much of, in, in, despite in a modified form, some of the culture that had been denied to them, uh, arguably was cheapened at the point at which it became something that was commercialized and like, uh, you know, appropriated by majority white American culture. So you might say, well, the original artwork still exists. No one was stopping, you know, well, they were, but for, let's assume that they weren't, right? They weren't stopping um, original blues and you know rock and roll black musicians from continuing in engaging in their artwork just because white people were doing it too but what they did change was the cultural value of it right it was it was not no longer something that you felt was unique to you um and so this is where i think if you end up in debates about cultural appropriation it's worth remembering that r rationally someone appropriating or, or misusing or misrepresenting someone else's culture doesn't affect the original culture but part of what makes that culture valuable to those people is the story that goes along with it and maybe it's the uniqueness and then the fact that it is special to them and something that they feel like either is exclusive to them or they license out to people to use with permission it's that 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 psychological change that has occurred at the point at which someone has appropriated that from your culture can still have meaning even if rational even if it seems irrational so that's um that's how to think about cultural appropriation debates from the perhaps less intuitive side uh or, or 
maybe maybe it's the more intuitive side i think the point is you need to be able to think about how people psychologically interact with artwork instead of just thinking about it strictly in the form as i as i alluded to at the beginning all right let's go on to the uh last part actually let's take a quick breather let's see we got some we need we've got some questions um so uh, anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a, a direct question Uh, okay. Yeah, sure, actually. Oh yeah, go for it. Sure. So I've actually debated a similar motion before about, say, white appropriation of, uh, of say, like black culture, but then like the intuitive ar argument for opposing would probably be, oh, because it really uh, commercialized it to a very strong degree, like sexualization and all that. So how would you justify that the increased like levels of awareness is some actually something that's good for it? Yeah, so you would, so you're right, you know, that's one of, the, that's a, a potential clash in that debate, that the commercialization of, of cultures can bring greater awareness to them. Now, le le let me adopt an uncritical oppositional stance to what you just said, just to illustrate how I might use some of the analysis that I just covered, right? Um, if I am a member of a vulnerable group, let's say, you know, African Americans in the, the late 70s, you know, hip hop is a big movement, it's representative of the, 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 the black struggle in America. Um, if they wanted that to be, you know, um, if, they, if they wanted that to be a vehicle for creating awareness, well then they could have created, tailored it in a form that wouldn't be so, should we say, hostile towards um, white American culture. A lot of it was very critical of white American culture, of issues like police brutality, etc. And that was probably quite alienating to all the white people. I think it was rather unpredictable that it ended up resonating with, you know, like middle and upper class white suburban kids who then elevate it into this like musical cultural phenomena. But the point is that probably wasn't their intention or they would have presented it in quite a different way. So if the people to whom that culture is important don't even consider awareness of their culture something that they prioritize but instead want that like cultural specificity to, to, to be maintained I, they, they want hip-hop to be a uniquely black expression of, of the struggles and of their life stories they are better placed to make that trade-off than, than you are um, so that's how you might respond right um, as in culture is something that is so important and is often irreplaceable or very difficult to replace um, once it is undermined or once that value is tarnished. Remember what I said, as soon as you knew that the Mona Lisa was a fake, you probably would immediately say, right, okay, well, I guess we won't bother going and queuing up for six hours to see it in the Louvre. Let's go, you know, eat a croissant by, by on the Fifth or on these morning instead. You know, that, that, that's like the breaking uh, cultural perceptions so profoundly psychologically impacts people um, that, that it's wor worth consider taking more seriously perhaps than people do um so yeah and then the, this i think then quite interestingly sakes into um cannot change the world and uh, probably most of you agreed at the beginning uh that it can uh but maybe throughout this process hopefully you you can start to see the glimpses of, of why it does so and it all comes back to this core idea of it provokes an emotional response in us. Now, why is that? I don't think I have a great slide. No, I didn't, I didn't have a written slide for this. So I'm just gonna do this verbally. Um, we're, humans are not perfectly rational creatures. We're not, we're not machines, right? Our brains are literally jelly filled with electricity. We don't process numbers very well. They don't tend to mean anything to us. If you hear the words, uh, thus far 1.5 million people have died in, uh, of COVID-19, like, you you feel bad and, and you would certainly never admit to it but it's a little bit less meaningful than if it's like if i tell you a friend of mine is currently in hospital on a ventilator um suddenly that like emotional connection that tangibility has a much more profound effect on your psyche it makes you pay attention more that story is fake but the point is the presentation of something in a way that elicits an emotional response is a much more effective way of getting people to pay attention to the message that it is that you're trying to convey so let's take George Orwell's 1984. He could have written an essay and published it on the front page of the biggest, some British newspaper, probably not on the front page, but you know, just published it somewhere, warning about the dangers of authoritarianism. In fact, people did. My, one of my favorite philosophers, Karl Popper, did exactly this. He wrote philosophy books on the dangers of authoritarianism. 
Um, very few of you, I imagine, have read Karl Popper. More of you, I imagine, have read or, or at least heard of 1984 and the idea of things being Orwellian. It's because that story uh, enters the mind of the average person who's not an, you know, an intellectual or a political activist or whatever in a way that is more profound, that, it, that is more impactful. Um, similarly, the, this photo here, uh, which is of uh, children fleeing a napalm attack in Vietnam, was circulated all over American society uh, during, uh, this would have been the 60s, right? Um, and prior to that, the news had, prior to this, the, you know, the news had been covering American soldiers are dying in Vietnam, the war is being discussed, actually a lot of it, a lot of the press was being hidden in to some extent, right? So a lot of the reports that were coming out were very uh, censored, very like toned down relative to the, to the truly horrifying war that was playing out in the jungles of Vietnam. And yet this picture, photography of course being a form of art, enters the American psyche and, and suddenly this war goes from numbers and, and concepts and ideology and the battle against communism to a girl burn, running down the street, street screaming, right? And that changed the psyche of the American people, probably not on its own, but it, it was certainly a big shift and it's recognized as being a point in which people went from uh, the war being an abstract thing that was happening to and understanding that this was a real atrocity that was affecting real people. And I could, you know, That's we true. have some other examples here. We have Woodstock, for example. Um, I'm gonna talk about Charlie Chaplin in a second, but yeah. Um, what was the question? Yep. Okay, how do you manage that in educational debates? For example, debates about funding, um, increased spending on humanities and arts, et cetera, against sciences. Um, well, I mean, I, I uh, I don't have a ready. I don't have a ready to go answer on that because I think funding the arts and funding the humanities are, are different things to start with. I think trying to trade off those against the like I, I, I'm not convinced that's a great motion. If I'm perfectly honest, um, as in I think good motions should provide both sides with sets of consequentialist or principled claims that clash with one another, and they don't really there. So I, I no, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of debates about funding art in general, um, a, a debate that was popular in the UK, I haven't seen set in a while, was like um, funding uh, lowbrow versus highbrow art. Uh, highbrow meaning like opera and like fine oil paintings and things like that. And lowbrow, like if you were framing smartly, you might be talking about things like, you know, um, local music scenes, art, uh, like rappers or just like, um, more sort of lower, I don't know, less complex, less fine art, right? Um, and actually, one argument you can make there is that art is an expression of people will use art typically when given the chance to express their life struggles and, and, and emotions and so on. And for a lot of people in society who would create what we would consider, well, not we, but like funders, art bodies would consider to be lowbrow art, actually have messages that society needs to hear a lot more than they need to hear the, the, the 15,000th reproduction of, you know, Mozart's piano concerto or whatever, right? So, um, like, yeah, uh, the, the power of art in its ability to attack our emotional faculties and con to convince us of things uh, through the use of emotion is how art changes the world and why it can do so quite uniquely. Um, you know, uh, a speech that lays out the facts will always be less persuasive than a speech that lays out the facts in a rhetorically powerful way. Um, so uh, this I think is another interesting example because it's quite linked to British culture. So um, uh, Charlie Chaplin was, oh my God, I actually don't know if he was British or American. I feel like I should know that. Um, so I'm gonna try and play this, uh, just a little bit of it, and then I'm gonna explain why. Um, so remember this is, if, at all costs, yeah, so this is, um, uh, uh, actor Charlie Chaplin, he's parodying Hitler. This was made during World War II. That country belongs to me. Right, but I'm this meeting we shall not discuss forward, the Austerlitz situation. Many subtle ways. For instance, at this interview, I have so arranged it that he will always be looking up at you. You looking down at him. At all times, his position will be inferior. Mm, excellent. Then again, we shall seat him here beside your bust. So that if you relax, that will always be glaring at him. Huh? Oh. Where is he now? 
resting. When he arrives, I have arranged that he shall enter from the far end of the room. Another psychological triumph. He will have the embarrassment of walking the entire length of the floor toward you. <laughs> Very good. Yes. His Excellency, Signor Napoloni, is now leaving his room. He's coming. He's coming. Quick. Give me a flower. A flower. Remember, at all times, you must be above him before him. Entering or leaving, you must be first. Hello, Hickey. Bigots, bigots. <laughs> How do you feel? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah, uh, my brother dictate. Okay. You're a nice so, man, oh, okay. So the video was playing at low FPS. Okay, that doesn't surprise me. The the, the main thing that you need to take away is um, the, the 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 film kind of creates this weird contrast between the public appearance of Hitler as this like respected, powerful, feared dictator, um, and then juxtaposes that with behind the scenes he's an incompetent, bumbling buffoon. And it really like humanizes him, but in like a very satirical manner. Uh, and satire is an enormously interesting aspect of art in debating and in, in, in the real world, because part of the power, I think I have this on the next slide. At all uh, cost. Yeah, here we go. Um, so I, I was gonna play the second video, but as I say, with the times weren't taking on. So um, during World War II, like Hitler was, the final boss of this like giant conflict racing, like uh, ravaging the entire planet basically. And yet um, this film, you know, and, and you know, that can be terrifying to people and maintaining the war effort requires ma maintaining and upholding the psyche of people. They need to feel confident, they need to feel empowered, you know, they, they need to feel like the war is worth waging in some sense in order for, for it to be successful. And so for, for British people at this point were, you know, being rationed in terms of food, they would, they, people didn't have enough to eat. Um, they were, very impoverished. Um, I'll come on to the child in a second because I think that's another very important uh, illustration of how art can change the world. Um, that, uh, you know, it really like tore down the idea of him being an invulnerable, all powerful dictator and instead say, say, said, like, you know, actually, he is just a man, he's just a human being and we can beat him. And that probably had an important impact on the psyche and the sort of the will to fight of people. Um, some other examples would be uh, well, yeah. Let's talk about the let's talk about the child. Um, during the 2015 2014 refugee crisis, we had uh, huge numbers of Syrians um, as well as Afghani's and Eritreans and, and a variety of other countries uh, fleeing uh, war zones basically to try and enter Europe uh, and in the UK as well um, in order to seek asylum. And the overwhelming consensus in all of the news was. Uh, keep them out. They're here coming to steal our jobs or um, something along some, 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 some sort of xenophobic bullshit like that. Um, and part of that was because the number 600,000 Syrians are attempting to enter Germany is uh, it's just a number and it, it, it's devoid of any context. But a photograph, a piece of artwork taken of, uh, sorry, if, I probably should have had a content warning. I actually didn't think this one through fully. Um, like we'll, we'll skip off this slide if it's disturbing people, but um, basically uh, a photo of a child that had attempted to cross the Mediterranean and drowned and washed up on the beaches of Italy was a way of taking that abstract concept and rooting it in people's minds through that emotional trigger that, that you know I said is the underpinning of artwork and, and making it clear to people that no, there is a human element to this. Um, and, and you know, photojournalism is, I, I think fits quite coherently um, with with our conception of artwork, but this was a, a, a in the end, I don't think it changed very much. I think um, ultimately that you know the nationalists reclaimed the um, the the battle of that, of that discussion, but nonetheless, for a brief moment, there was at least an, out, an outpouring of sympathy sparked by what is functionally a piece of artwork. Um, and I think, uh, as as this slide says, um, that you know we can draw a number of conclusions from this. Um, which are, firstly, the artwork that we consume changes our perception of society, right? That's why there's so much discussion around things like racial stereotyping in popular media, because, um, because of its unique power to shape the way that we think about the world, we have to be careful 
about what it is that is in the artwork that we are consuming and creating because it has the power to reshape society in ways that are often not even immediately not not even intended but also just not even predictable right so like ayn rand's atlas shrugged is honestly one of the shittiest books i've ever read it's just terribly written it's like the the quality of the of the dialogue is atrocious the it's like i don't, I don't think it's particularly sophisticated um but it is very emotive uh it, it is genuinely quite stirring at times when you read it and there's a, believe me a lot of people have built an, like an entire political and psychological identity of libertarianism just on the basis of what is not even actually a work of philosophy. It's just a story. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then lastly, you know, talking about censorship um, and how uh, authoritarian states, well, why do they want to ban artwork, right? If artwork, because people say, sorry, this is where I'm going on a little rant, right? People say art debates are boring because they're low impact. Like, if that was true, you wouldn't have governments censoring the artwork that people created. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, give it away, but there was a different photo on this slide originally. And in the context of the uh, country, should we say, that is uh, hosting this competition, I realized that photo would not be appropriate. Um, and, and the power, therefore, of artwork uh, to radically change like society, to enrage people, to fill people with hope, to fill people um, with sympathy uh, is proof I think of the fact or analysis if you need it in debate terms that artwork can change the world and that we should not be thinking about artwork debates through as low impact um, but instead should be understanding that if explained properly um, that the power of artwork to, to affect change in the world is almost infinite. Um, so this now kind of closes the, the philosophical discussions um, and, and sort of um, I'll give you some sort of practical tips screenshot there so i'll upload the slides as well later um but when you're thinking about artwork debates when you when you're looking at the motion um think about the form uh is the form important to the debate uh or is the interpretation important a lot of the time the interpretation you'll realize is actually what's more important and that if you think about the context that uh, uh, um that that could exist around the artwork that is being discussed in the debate or how the motion is changing the context in which art is produced um, that then you immediately start to tap into a well of arguments. Uh, alternatively, you, um, you can think about the, the actors involved. So how does this affect how people consume art? How does this affect artists themselves? How does this affect people who are the topic of the artwork that is being created, whether that's because they are victims of, of the stereotypes that are being depicted, or, or, or whether they are the people who you are trying to help through your advocacy of the artwork that you are creating. Um, and the last thing that I want you to think about is, um, and I wrote this before the Delta article, so I forgot that this was in here. Um, but but yeah, um, some artworks are, some art debates are low impact. That's fine. Uh, psychology is an impact in and of itself. If you can prove that on your side, the experience of people who consume artwork improves, that makes people feel good. That is an impact. That is a consequentialist impact, a practical impact. Um, so you you know you can have um you you can think about debates just through the terms of how they make people feel or how they enable people to to um you know present uh, to communicate about themselves right but the other thing i want you to think about and this goes back to the some of the discussion i had on changing the world is you can have large impacts and just be honest about the fact that the motion is making a small contribution it has a small delta uh, on what is a large impact. I've also heard this described as a very small rudder uh, slowly turning a very large boat. So no, maybe one piece of artwork that attempts to um, you know, discuss uh, or, or present some issue of like racial inequality or, or, or gender inequality or whatever um, is, is not going to change the world. Just one piece of artwork maybe isn't going to change the world. But it is going to push us in a different direction and the combination of thousands upon thousands of individual people creating artwork that does talk to people's emotions and, and convince them and each individual one has a, that, that small repetitive you know drip 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 of impacts of changing people's psyche through manipulating not manipulating well it is manipulating but it's you know intentionally doing so honestly doing so it's artwork you know you're not expecting it to tell you the truth it's not news it's not science right but but the cumulative impact of of lots of individual pieces of artwork that allow people to express themselves or that allow people to to communicate messages is cumulatively very large now
then that can be good or it can be bad, right? That That's not a fixed good. Not all artwork is created to make the world a better place. A lot of artwork um, is created to, to, to harm people or to, or to criticize ideas or whatever. But um, situate your expectations realistically in the debate. If the debate is like, you know, banning certain form of artwork entirely, probably your impacts can be quite large. If it's slightly increasing the funding to some uh, art councils or whatever, your impacts may be a little bit smaller, but nonetheless, hopefully this has given you a better insight into how to analyze them or how to generate arguments that do go beyond the standard people make more money off this art, off being able to sell their art or, or, or something like that. Um, the last thing is, uh, you, well, actually, I already covered this in the previous thing. So, um, you know, sometimes even if you can't attribute large scale social change, remember that art is really important in a lot of instances to the people who consume it. Like, um, this man playing the saxophone is clearly having a rather large impact on these two men to the right. Like, they are vibing, right? Um, uh, so, yeah, remember that psychology and how people feel is, is, is always an avenue to discuss in the debates. Um, and, you know, some other things uh, is kind of probably less you know, educational for you. We're all used to thinking about race and class and gender in debates, but also think sometimes about the artists themselves and what they wanted to accomplish. So what, what, what is, if we are in, in some sense, um, uh, to, I'll come back, to, sorry, I see the question. Um, so in some sense, you know, think about what the uh, artist wanted to accomplish and maybe sometimes don't focus debates purely in, um, you know, the consumers, but actually the artists themselves is, is a important autonomous uh, actor and maybe sometimes motions and thinking about how it affects artists and what the rights of artists are is also equally important. Um, so one of the questions was, what do I think is more important, the form or the interpretation? Um, the, the interpretation is, is the answer, but remember, the form facilitates the interpretation. So, like, the, the, there's kind of multiple layers to this performance that we're seeing in front of us, right? these two guys would probably be enjoying but not to nearly the extent if they were at home listening to this on a vinyl or a mp3 player or whatever right you, you, if we were watching a video of this man playing live it probably wouldn't have the same impact but the, the experience of being there of being like a meter away from this person of, of having a crowd of like-minded people around us changes the context in which we experience the art changes the interpretation of the art for us and it elevates it to another level despite the fact that the objectively the formative experience that you know the quality of the sound that reaches my ears is always going to be worse coming from from a you know noisy room uh the, the artist has, doesn't get to have five goes at recording it perfectly but actually maybe the the imperfections in the form there the, the fact that they're not hitting every note perfectly is is all in of itself improving the, the experience the interpretation uh and with that uh i have some motions that we can sit and discuss um, I'm here to answer questions, but otherwise that, that concludes the discussion. Um, it was a little on the long side. Uh, I was hoping to keep it to about an hour and 20, but, you know, uh, hopefully, as I say, this wasn't strictly a list of arguments to use in arts debates, because I don't think that helps you in any debate where the arguments that I didn't cover don't come up. What I wanted to get across to you was how to understand and think about art from a very fundamental level so that you can use all of the analytical and argumentative tools that you've otherwise developed, but now you, you kind of have the, the underpinning understanding of, of art, as, a, as I said, as a process of, of intent, um, of, of form, and of creation, and of, and of reception, and the interpretation, uh, and everything that goes around that, and how that facilitates what we otherwise understand to be hopefully you understand to be the, the relatively enormous impacts that art can have on society. So yeah, 